This video is brought to you by Pedal. Hey Wisecrack, Michael here to talk about everyone's favorite bounty hunter turned world's greatest stepdad, The Mandalorian. Now, despite making one of the year's best shows, its creators break a fundamental rule of visual storytelling. Show your characters freaking faces. But is this rule bending what makes The Mandalorian so engaging in the first place? Let's find out in this wisecrack edition on Star Wars and masked emotions. Spoilers ahead for all things Star Wars and the MCU. And before we get into it, I wanna give a shout out to this video sponsor, Pedal. Pedal is a credit card company that wants to help you succeed financially. The Pedal One card was designed to help you build credit. Many credit card companies base your credit limit or credit worthiness on your credit score. But if you haven't established a credit score yet, it can be hard to get approved for the card you need. Instead of a credit score, Pedal uses your banking history to create a cash score, which is essentially just a measure of your income, spending, and savings. The Pedal One card is partnered with WebBank, member FDIC, which issues the card. The Pedal One card has no annual fees and as of today has variable APRs ranging from 19.99% to 29.49%. The Pedal One's credit limit starts at $500 and can range up to $5,000, which can help keep your credit utilization low. And after all, that's a key part of building your credit score. So check out the Pedal One card today. Go to pedalcard.com slash wisecrack to find out more. That's Petal with a T, P-E-T-A-L, card.com slash wisecrack. Now, back to the show. Now, a word on why human faces are so important to our experience of visual storytelling. While most early cinema typically presented the audience a view of the world akin to a theatrical stage, some early filmmakers immediately understood that what distinguished film from theater was its ability to mess with time, space, and perspective. Enter the close-up, famously employed by early filmmaker D.W. Griffith. Close-ups were incredibly effective in silent film, which didn't have dialogue, just soundtracks full of jaunty piano and some on-screen descriptions to help establish exactly why a character was angry that day. Facial expressions filled the emotional gap, epitomized by the performances in the 1928 film The Passion of Joan of Arc. And this train kept rolling into the era of talkies, with close-ups of actors' faces becoming increasingly prevalent in the 30s and 40s. Just think about some of the iconic scenes from classics like Citizen Kane and Casablanca, where the camera lingers on an expressive face rather than resorting to dialogue. Film theorist Bela Balaz describes these shots as the very instant in which the general is trained transformed into the particular. And this isn't just a remnant of classic cinema. Recent decades have witnessed an increased reliance on close-ups in both film and TV. At the most pivotal moment of the entirety of the MCU's decade-long run, we are close on Robert Downey Jr.'s face right before the snap heard around the galaxy. While he says very little, his expression conveys years of struggle and growth, all leading to a moment where this character was able to sacrifice his life for those he loves. It's also why, if I may indulge in a tangent, Nicolas Cage had to fight director Robert Bierman to wear sunglasses in the Wisecrack Hall of Fame-worthy Vampire's Kiss. Bierman complained the glasses would shut out the audience, a fair concern when your famous actor's face is your best cinematic asset. I'm calling the police. Police? Alva! I'm here to call a truce, man! Look! As usual, Cage prevailed gloriously. All that to say, seeing the faces of actors matters a lot in terms of how we experience cinema. Philosophers like Amy Copeland have even noted that we are able to catch the emotions of a film character through contagion. And in catching these emotions, we're sort of fusing our own emotions with those of the character. Which makes it all the more impressive and honestly kind of confusing that a show like The Mandalorian is able to convey so much emotion when its protagonist is wearing a mask for all but about 90 seconds in the first two seasons. We feel like we know when Mando is angry or scared or sad or happy without ever gazing upon Pedro Pascal's gorgeous face. And even though we technically see the face of the show's co-lead, Grogu, who I still refer to as Baby Yoda, sue me. His face moves about as much as the friend that thought the edible gummies were normal gummies and spends the entire runtime of Super Troopers convinced they are trapped in their body with no way out. Oh, and Baby Yoda can't talk. So between two lead characters, we have one with a visible face and one who communicates in a discernible language. Now, the whole man in the iron mask thing isn't new to the larger Star Wars universe. In the first film, A New Hope, two of the first characters we meet are C-3PO and R2-D2, neither of whom have the ability to bat their lashes or do the duck face thing that dominated the early days of selfie culture. 
But in both cases, we are immediately emotionally connected with these characters, with C-3PO conveying a genuine anxiety. We'll be destroyed for sure. This is madness. And R2-D2 embodying a reckless and adventurous spirit. There'll be no escape for the princess this time. But for a character like Darth Vader, the mask is the point. The hidden face makes him more mysterious, inaccessible, and daunting, like Nicolas Cage's iconic character Peter Lowe in Vampire's Kiss. The goddamn contract is somewhere in those goddamn fucking files! Sorry, I, I couldn't help myself. So how is Star Wars consistently able to break a fundamental principle of compelling filmmaking and still create an emotional connection with its audience? We might be able to see how if we get back to the roots of Star Wars by considering one of George Lucas' essential influences, Akira Kurosawa, a Japanese director who earned international acclaim in the mid 20th century for films like Ikiru, Seven Samurai, and his Macbeth adaptation, Throne of Blood. His film Hidden Fortress was a direct inspiration for the original Star Wars film, and George Lucas actually helped Kurosawa get his films financed in the latter part of his career. And while that might be no secret to Star Wars fans, what is even more interesting is one of Kurosawa's influences, a form of theater that was really into covering the faces of its lead actors. No is a style of traditional Japanese dance-based theater in which some actors wear traditional masks, and the non-mask wearing actors give extremely subtle and restrained performances. It's all very un-Broadway. Since the mask wearing actors have stagnant facial expressions, they are unable to communicate their moral leanings or emotional states in a traditional fashion. This places more emphasis on the subtleties of their physical movements, and leads the audience to find universal themes and emotions in the actor's minimalist performances. It's a real less is more scenario. No's influence on Kurosawa is especially evident in Throne of Blood, which would go on to influence Lucas's work on the prequels, specifically where the director used aspects of no theater to make complex emotions visible in new ways, rather than relying on the expressive performances commonly seen in film. He does this through employing the Japanese aesthetic category of yugen, which describes an often theatrically inspired emotion that transcends singular movements or scenes. The use of masks and minimal facial expressions in unmasked actors help create this aesthetic, as their more minimal and controlled movements inspire the imagination of the audience, making them active parts of the performance. Yugen isn't something that the actors do. Rather, it describes what the audience feels while watching a performance. We can see this in Throne of Blood in a scene where Washizu has a Breaking Bad moment when he kills an assassin to cover up his own deeds and is immediately hit with the weight of his decision. Which of course isn't too far off from this Star Wars scene in which Anakin helps Palpatine kill Mace Windu and seals his fate as one of the bad guys. In both cases, the audience feels the enormity of what What's just happened and knows it won't end well. Obviously, Kurosawa uses no categories like Yugen to elicit a response from an audience watching on a screen, but for No itself, the aim was to create these types of responses in a theatrical setting. The principles of No can help us better understand why we find Mando's growing love and commitment to Grogu so compelling. Without ever seeing his face, we see him go from indifferent to the child as he drops him off to be experimented on by some very unchill looking dudes, to curious about what the hell baby Baby Yoda actually is, to being disappointed in him for eating a frog woman's unfertilized eggs, to expressing a deep love and care for him. While not masked, Baby Yoda also conveys emotion through minimal facial activity and bodily movements. The artist also known as Grogu might just be one of the best examples of No in Star Wars. Because as a speechless puppet, he relies on muted gestures to express any and all emotions. Much like his potential dad, or grandpa, or uncle, or cousin Yoda, we can see the inspiration for these characters in Kurosawa's Throne of Blood, and in particular, the spirit in the forest. And it's likely not a coincidence that the spider's web forest in the film looks a whole lot like Yoda's adopted home planet of Dagobah. Take the scene where baby Yoda uses his powers to save his new daddy from death by Mudhorn. While the tiny green puppet does little more than scrunch its face up a little bit, a tremendous amount of care is communicated. This is one of the first times we realize that the little guy loves Mando, and doesn't want to watch him get murdered. And throughout the series, we see Baby Yoda gaze at Mando in a way that shows us the deep bond forming between them. Okay, here we go. There are countless examples of emotions that are quite literally masked in the original Star Wars trilogy. Take the pivotal moment where our guy Darth has to choose between serving his master, Palpatine, or saving the life of his son, Luke. It's an intense scene, and you can really feel the conflict in Darth's dark mechanical heart, even though he's masked the entire time. 
This gets at another important aspect of no theater. Since the masks are stagnant, unlike the kind seen in the 90s Jim Carrey classic, The Mask, the actors don't move a lot. In moving less, these actors are able to say more. When the audience is caught up in quiet and stillness, little movements can have a big impact. A related no concept is Hana, which describes the sensations that an actor awakes in a spectator, in which an actor's art blooms like a flower. And while blooming flowers and genocidal Sith Lords might not have a lot in common, it's incredible that after three films of being a space fascist, we're able to feel empathy for Darth's emotional growth. This makes Vader's actions all the more powerful when he throws his master into the reactor of the Death Star, which, you know, would obviously kill someone and make it impossible for him to come back six films later in a pivotal role that retroactively makes the previous two films more or less meaningless. But I digress. You can compare the mature, masked Vader in the original trilogy to the brooding, over-emotive Anakin in the prequel trilogy. Some of the former performance feels more emotionally intense and expressive, even though he's in a robot suit, while the latter performance, full of both verbal and physical expressiveness, feels far less impactful. This all might help us understand why The Mandalorian is so damn compelling. While, hypothetically, the most recent Star Wars trilogy made us consider a global moratorium on the production of any Star Wars-related content, Mando and Grogu's adventures through the Outer Rim have restored our faith in Star Wars. One might say that they've offered us a new hope. And this is why the influence of No is so crucial. By creating limits on facial and bodily movements, it places a heightened emphasis on subtle forms of expression and imbues small things with big meanings. We can think of No as adding a sort of special flavor to film, which is why Yugen, an aspect of No, can be thought of as the umami of emotion. When used well, it can pull an extra layer of feeling from the audience and have you spending weeks wondering if Mando is ever going to see Grogu again and praying that he doesn't end up at Luke's Jedi Academy when Ben becomes Kylo Ren. No theater helps us get why the show is so good. It succeeds not because of how much it shows, but because of how little. And rather than making the show feel hollow and cold, this restraint and use of metal masks makes little things so much more powerful. Now, some of this might be complicated by the fact that Mando eventually does take his helmet off in the final moments of Season 2, leading us to wonder if he'll spend parts of Season 3 showing his face in the Outer Rim's various dive bars. But even if he does lose the mask, we would bet that the influence of No will remain palpable, whether in the minimal movements and dialogue of key characters, or by his growing gang of new Mandalorian friends. But what do you think, Wisecrack? Can a Japanese theater tradition help us better appreciate the performance of masked characters in the Star Wars cinematic universe? Or would everyone be better off if these guys dropped the helmets and used their eyes to express some emotion? Let us know what you think in the comments. Thanks to our patrons for all your support. Be sure to hit that subscribe button like you're firing up your Mandalorian jetpack, and ring that bell like you're calling some Jedis from the peak of Force Mountain. And as always, thanks for watching. Later.